Amen. Well, uh, you know, that's an old song that probably many of you have heard when you were a child or heard it at different times in your life. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Would you agree that Christians are blessed? Yes. I mean, we would sit in church and say, Christians are blessed. Yeah, I just read a verse out of Ephesians, you know, we're just blessed on top of blessings with every spiritual blessing. But I want to ask you, would you say sometimes we can sing in church and say, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and maybe even Sunday afternoon, we're so discouraged about something? Or maybe even during the week, we're like, man, I'm worried about this, I'm worried about that, I'm worried about this with my kids, I'm worried about this with my parents, I'm worried about this with somebody, and worried about this at work, and i got financial things that are weighing on my mind, and I've got all these different things that feel like we just are like weighed down. Everybody, oh, I see people shaking their head. I start to ask the question, but you're already agreeing with me. Yeah, so wait a minute. How can we say that we're blessed and at the same time, we get so overwhelmed with life all the time. Would you agree sometimes it seems kind of crazy? The Bible says, I mean, there's Paul in jail. He got beat, beaten, and he's thrown in jail. He's in stocks, and yet he's singing to the Lord at midnight. Now, most of us should be sleeping at midnight, but I mean, he's sitting there singing with blood probably coming out of the back of him at the same time. How does he do that? The Bible talks to us about joy. I want you to hear something today, just as we start. Those that are saved by His grace have immeasurable, countless, unbelievable blessings, and we should walk in joy. The thing that we don't get is, how do I do that? What do I need to remember? What are those things that hinder me from walking in joy? Now, if you haven't been with us, we're in Romans. You can open up your Bibles to the book of Romans, to Romans chapter 5, and uh, we're going to go dive right back into Romans here in just a minute, but let me kind of set the stage. Here's what's happened. In Romans 1, here's what Paul says. In Romans 1, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And then he says, let me tell you about the gospel. And starting in Romans 1, verse 18, he goes, you're a sinner. And in Romans chapter 2, he goes, you're a sinner. And we're thinking, okay, I got it. In Romans chapter 3, he goes, you're a sinner. And he just keeps telling us that. And then you get to Romans chapter 3. If you've got your Bible, you can go to like Romans chapter 3, verse 24. And he says in Romans 3, 24, he says, you have been justified. You're made just before God as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly. And there's, remember, I don't know if you were here, we looked at that big word, propitiation, through his blood. He said Jesus paid it all on the cross. And then in chapter 4, he said, it's only by faith. There's not one thing that we can do to save ourselves. Faith is what we have to do. We have to turn to the Lord in faith. We're justified by faith. And so he has said all that in the preceding four chapters. And if you've got your Bible open there at the end of chapter 4, where we ended last week, in chapter 4, verse uh, 25, he goes, He, Jesus, who was delivered over because of our transgressions, that's our sins, and was raised because of our justification. He's raised from the dead. I want you to read with me. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore. Now he's saying, Therefore, because you are saved, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exult in hope of the glory of God. Verse 3, and not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character hope. Verse 5, and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And then what does he say there? For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. Verse 8, but God 
demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Now, I will go just a shade further. I'll stop there and reading the text. I want you to just hear this as we even start today. In this whole text, here's what he's saying. He's saying, you've been saved, Christian, but I don't think you understand. It's not fire insurance. He said, it's not like all of a sudden you got saved and you're not going to hell. He says, there's blessings stacked up on top of blessings, on top of blessings. That verse I read in the welcome in Ephesians, he tells the church in, in Ephesus that same message. He says, we are blessed beyond measure. But just like the first century, when you all agree we can forget it? We can get so wrapped up in all of our issues of the day and all the junk going on in our life that we forget how blessed we are. Somehow, Paul never forgot it. Paul would be beaten, thrown in jail, shipwrecked, stoned, all these different things, and Paul all, calls all that stuff. You may remember it in 2 Corinthians 4. He goes, oh, that's temporary light affliction. That's his word. I'm thinking, what? I mean, I'm thinking, you know, I'd be crying on the couch, you know, about all these problems in my life. Paul says, I count it all joy. And so how does he do that? That's what we want to look at. I want, I'm just going to walk through this text, and I want you to see the blessings that a Christian has. Here's the first one. Look at verse 1. It says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Now, here's what that means. Anybody, I tell you what, look down there in your Bible. Look down there in verse 10. I didn't read that far. Guess what it says we were in verse 10 before we got saved? Anybody see that word there? We were, yeah, I see some of you saying We were enemies of God. Now, you might not believe that. If you are not saved, if you're sitting here in this room and you say, I do not know that if I die tonight, I'll be in heaven. I do not know that I've been saved by the grace of God. By the way, that's the only way of salvation is through the blood of Jesus Christ. And if you have not been saved by his blood, the Bible says, I was, before I was saved, I was an enemy of God. It says every person that can hear my voice right now, if you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior, the Bible says you're an enemy of God. You go, really? Yeah. The Bible even says, we've been studying the book of John on Wednesday night. He even is speaking to a group, and Jesus said, if you're not of me, your father's the devil. Y'all remember that? We were looking at that on a Wednesday night. And what's he saying there? He said, there's only two groups of people, a person that's saved or a person that is, we sometimes use the word lost or an enemy of God. And now he uses the word, oh, and I'll put my name in there. He goes, oh, you're saved by grace, Wayne. He goes, you have peace with God. He is saying the very first blessing that we have is if we're saved by his grace, we have peace. And here's what he means. He says, no, er, never, ever, ever again are you an enemy of God. Never, ever, ever again are you in opposition. And in fact, if you were to go look at that word in verse 1, he goes, we have peace. That means today we have peace. You want to read it next week? You have peace. You want to read it a year from now? You have peace. Read it 10,000 years from now? You have peace. That's the construction of the word if you go look at the original language. It is saying you always, forevermore, are now at peace with God. Hey, that right there, I could stop this morning. <laughs> I mean, he says you are at peace. No longer an enemy of God. But it's almost like Paul says... Hey, I'm just getting started. Look at the next verse. He goes, we have peace with God. Now, don't miss it. He does say that peace only comes through Jesus Christ, only him alone. And then what does he say? We, and through whom we have obtained, in the translation I'm reading from, it uses the word introduction. Anybody in here have a different word in there that maybe says the word access? Anybody say, yeah, see. Yeah, anybody, yeah, see. So access is probably the more common translation there, and I think it's a really, really good translation. Here's what he is saying. Do any, now, some of y'all may not remember this. Some of y'all know have been studying in the book of Exodus. Do y'all remember that when the temple or tabernacle is constructed, there was this mercy seat and the Ark of the Covenant, 
Some of you might even remember seeing Raiders of the Lost Ark, and you know, you know, they were trying to find it. But anyway, you know, it says that was there in a place called the Holy of Holies. One time a year, the high priest would go in there, and he went through all these procedures to go get uh, cleaned up, so to speak. And he would go into the Holy of Holies and put blood, sprinkle blood on the mercy seat. It was a picture to us of the blood of Christ. It did not save. But it was God's way of telling us that's what has to happen for sin. There has to be blood. But could anybody go into the Holy of Holies? No. Could anybody go in there like at any time? No. There was one time a year, God designated it, a day of atonement, one moment a year, and the priest goes in there to say, I'm representing, so to speak, the people in this moment. People did not have access to God. Now, do y'all remember when the cross occurred? And you remember in Matthew. You remember in Matthew, it tells us all those crazy things like the sky gets dark, and there was an earthquake, but there was one other thing that it tells us. It says that big veil that was in front of the Holy of Holies, that said nobody could go in there, it's ripped, just like a sheet of paper from top to bottom. And you go, really? Yeah. And oh, by the way, if you go study it, there's only one way that got ripped. God did it. Supernaturally, God reached down from heaven and ripped apart that veil that was in front of the Holy of Holies. Why did he do that? He says, no longer is there a need for a high priest. No longer is there this holy of holies that you can't go in there any time at all. He says, now you've got unlimited access, unlimited minutes. You've got unlimited access. You've got free texting. You can do whatever you want any time of the day or night. No matter where you are in the world, it's always there. That's what the word here means. He says, Christian, once you are saved by the grace of God, you have access. Now, I I tell you, it's, it's so great to see this. Flip over in the book of Hebrews in chapter 4, verse 16. It's the very last verse in chapter 4 of Hebrews. And here's what it says. It says, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. What a beautiful phrase. So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Here's what it says. It says, Christian, There is a throne room of heaven now, and you can approach that throne anytime, at all time. And God calls it, I didn't, God calls it the throne of grace. He says, because now Jesus Christ covered you with the blood of Jesus, and you can go right before the throne anytime, any problem, any concern, any care. If you're a note taker, 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. Psalm 55, verse 22 says, Cast your burdens upon the Lord, and He will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. It tells us in Psalm 55. Over and over through Scripture, He goes, You now have access. In that first century, sometimes we think, Oh, yeah, I've heard that all my life. In the first century, they're going, Whoa! We thought it was one time a year the priest got to go in there, and we stood way away. He says, No longer. You don't need a priest to go through someone. You can go directly to God because of salvation by grace through Jesus Christ. Amen. Woo, what a promise. But he says, oh no, it's like you ever received a gift and you open the gift and you pull a great thing out and then all of a sudden somebody says, oh no, keep looking, there's other things in the bag, you know? And you go, oh, this is great. Well, that's the way this passage is. It's like God just keeps saying there's more and there's more and there's more. And if you look at the, the next uh, word there, he goes, through uh, access by faith into this grace in which we stand. Now, do you ever feel like some days, or maybe sometime in your life, you're a Christian? I can say yes to what I'm about to ask. Have you ever felt like you failed God? Anybody ever feel like, I told God, you know, God, I'll follow you anywhere. I'll do anything you say. And that same very day, you go, how did I do that? I can't believe I just said those words 
that were unkind that came from my mouth. I can't believe that I just was so caught up with worry and fear that I'm just tangled up in knots over this, and I told God that I trust him. You ever had things like that? Or maybe other things in your life where you just feel like, man, I blew it as a Christian. This little phrase is for us. He says, as a Christian, the grace never gives out. He says, this grace in which we stand. He says, if you're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, you're not crumpled up in the fetal position. He says, you stand in the grace of God, no matter what's going on. I blew it. God says, I still pour out grace on your life. I blew it. God says, you stand in my grace. I blew it. God says, you're forgiven forever for all of eternity. You can't lose it. You can't do anything. You didn't do anything to get it. You can't do anything to lose it. He says, you stand in that grace. Amen. Is that not awesome? That's Because, hey, I don't know everybody in here's personal life, but I do know this. We all mess up. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, we all mess up. And that verse, it's like Paul saying, hey, don't get caught up with guilt. Don't get caught up with shame. Don't get caught up with saying, I have just been a total wreck in my life. He goes, you stand in the grace of God. And look at his next word, and he says, and we exult. Now, some of your Bibles aren't going to have that word there, but it's really a good descriptive word there. He uses it multiple times in this text. He says, we are pinging off the walls joyful. He said, we are so caught up with what God has done in our lives that we stand and saying, I can't believe that God has forgiven me, forgiven me, forgiven me, forgiven me. I'm at peace with God. I stand in the grace of God. I have access to God in the darkest moments of my life. And then he says, we exult in hope. And that word hope is not hope so. The Bible uses the word hope in many cases to almost be like a steady, calm assurance. He is saying, we stand here firmly looking to, I have hope, I get this, of the glory of God. He says, you know what? You stand in the grace of God, but you still live in a world of sin, right? You stand in the grace of God, we still have headaches and heartaches, right? But he says, guess what? You can stand and exult in hope of the glory of God. Guess what that means? That means every Christian for all of eternity has a home in heaven with God forever and ever in his glory, walking with him. He's going to talk some more about that here in just a minute. He says, you have a home in heaven. Now, you just got to go and look at it with me. Go to Revelation. You know, over the last uh, few weeks, we've looked at Revelation 20 a few times. In Revelation 20, it says, if anyone's name is not found written in the Lamb's book of life, they are cast into the lake of fire. Sometimes we use the word hell, and we say someone gets cast into hell because they didn't put their faith and trust in Jesus. Their name's not written in the Lamb's book of life. But he goes further, and he goes into Revelation verse 21, and here's what he says in Revelation 21. He goes, oh, for those that are saved, now read the highlights in Revelation 21. Here's what he says. You're going to live in a new heaven and a new earth. He says there in verse 3, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. Now slow down and read that about three times. Here's what he says. He says every Christian will live for all of eternity in the presence of Almighty God, surrounded by his glory, which I really fully can't comprehend, but he says that's where we will be. And he even says, let me tell you how good it is. He says, for those of us who are still here on earth, he goes, listen, they will be his people and God himself will be among them and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will no longer be any death and there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. All of those things are gone. It's what he says there in that text. Hallelujah. I mean, that is like, we can't comprehend it. But he goes on in the text, and he says all the way over in verse 22, he goes, I, seen, I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb were its temple. 
and the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. That's Jesus. He is sitting there saying, Christian, that's your future. He says, we get tangled up and worried about something minor today and get angry about it or get upset about it or pout about it or whatever word you want to use on it. And he said, we forget, we got a home in heaven. He said, we got a home for all of eternity with Almighty God. And he goes, don't you forget. And he uses the word there in verse 2. He goes, we should have great, great, great joy. But again, you're still reaching into the bag. But here's what he says. Anybody in here about right now, are you thinking, Pastor, that sounds awesome. But I still got to deal with today. He said, I still got to deal with all the headaches I got today. I still got bills to pay. I still got health issues. I still got conflicts with people. I still got all these different things going on in my life. And look what he says there in verse 3. He says, and not only this, but we shall, there's the word again, exult in our tribulations. Knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. Now, I'm going to just stop there at that one phrase because I want you to hear what he's saying. He says, I am joyful of my future, but I also am joyful when I go through my trials. He said, I'm joyful when I go through my headaches. I am joyful when I go. Now, here, let me give you some examples. Remember I mentioned earlier, there's Paul in jail. He just was beaten. He's just in stocks. He doesn't even really know exactly what's going to happen to him. He's singing praises to Jesus that night. You remember Joseph? Joseph, for years, falsely accused, in prison. The first time he gets a chance to get before Pharaoh, does he say, get me out of here. Let me point fingers and tell you how great I am. What does he say? It's all about God. His trust is in God. His joy is in God. And what does he tell us here? He says, we will have tribulation. Now let me just kind of hit a few highlights here. Here's the first one. Those saved by grace should remember this. God is at work in your life. Did y'all hear me? God is at work in your life. If you were saved by his grace, he tells you in 2 Corinthians 5.17 that you're a new creation in Christ. He tells you in Philippians 1.6 that he who saved you will work in your life from your moment of salvation until your death. He is working to make us more Christ-like. And then we go to heaven. It gets even better. But he said he is working in us to always grow us and mature us. So when he says we exult, he goes, yep, we're going to have trials. Yes, we're going to have things that happen in our life. He is telling us, everybody hear me. I don't want you to be misled. Christians will have trials and tribulations. The Bible does not tell us in any shape, form, or fashion, everything's just going to be peachy keen. Everything's going to be, you know, me, I like ice cream, so everything's going to be ice cream, you know, I mean, and chocolate. You know, it's not saying that. It's saying there will be tribulations. When he looks there in that verse, he says, we exult in our tribulations. Like, make sure you understand, they're going to happen. We are going to have situations in our life where we're in trials. Now, you may go, why do we have trials? Well, that's a whole other sermon, but I'll hit two or three highlights. We have some tribulations because of our sin. We do dumb things. Do you agree? I mean, we do. We do dumb things, and we get ourselves in a mess, and so we have some tribulations. God still forgives us. God still says, let's go forward, but we sometimes reap what we've sown. Sometimes we have tribulation because God says, I've chosen that for your life right now. I know that's what is best. You don't understand it at all. Think about Job. And he says, but that's what I'm going to put you through right now. Trust me, trust me, trust me. And we also know, it's in Romans, that God's working to make us more and more and more like Jesus. So because of that, we all know it, I'll just remind us, none of us are like Jesus yet. None of us are there. So God is going to be working in our lives to make us more and more and more like Jesus. 
we will have trials. But look what he says in that text. He says, we exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance proving character, and proving character hope. What is all that telling us? He's saying, we will have trials in our life to grow us in our faith, to get us stronger, to stand firm, to get us, my translation uses the word proving character, but it's really to say, to make us more and more and more like Jesus. But he also says to develop our hope. Because you see, would y'all not agree that most of the time we're more worried about what's going to happen to me today than what's going to happen for eternity? Wouldn't y'all agree? We get way more fretful about the issues of today than what matters a billion years. And, and you know, we aren't going to live. Let's just say there's some in here that's going to live to be 105. But I mean, you know, the average is about 80. We worry more about that than the bazillion years that we're going to be in eternity. We really do. And he said, I want you to develop more and more with an eternal focus. Look at what matters for heaven. That's why Paul could write temporary light affliction. Because Paul's saying, that's just for a few years. I'm worried about people coming to know Christ. I want people to know Jesus. Now, i got to show you the best part for me in this text. He goes, and we develop more and more hope, more and more eternal focus. It does not disappoint. Look at verse 5. Because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Now, I don't know about in your life. My parents, well, they love me to death. To their dying breath, I always knew the love of my parents. I always knew the love of all of my grandparents. That is one of the most earthly examples I can give you of love. You know, I knew they were always in my corner. I always knew that they were going to be there to help me and support me and defend me. Never even questioned that in my mind. I knew of their great love. But let me tell you, it has no comparison to the love of God. It has no comparison. And he says, Christian, the love of God has been poured out within your heart. He is like you are now drenched in the love of God. When he uses the word poured out there, he is saying as a Christian, God has reached down to you and just dumped the love of God flowing into and through your life. Is that, I mean, the words are there. He says, listen, he goes, the love of God has been poured out. But he says something else in that text that I want you to see. Yes, we have the love of God abundantly given, surrounding us. You know what? I got about a minute. Flip over to Romans 8. Just stay in that book and go to Romans 8. Many of you have seen this. Go to Romans 8. In Romans 8, he says in verse 31, if God is for us, who is against us? In Romans 8, verse 37, he goes, in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Look at Romans 8, 38. For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, listen, will be able to separate us from the love of God of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. We should shout amen. I mean, he is saying we can never, ever get away from the love of God. If some of you in the room are saying, man, I feel so discouraged. If you're a Christian today, I want you to know you are not out of the hand of the love of God. You are completely in the love of God. In fact, he tells you in Hebrews 13, he says, I will never leave you. I will never desert you. I will never forsake you. Wow. But there's a little phrase there at the end of verse 5. He says, let me tell you about love. He says, you've been given a gift that you can't even fully comprehend. And the word there is gift. He says, you've been given the Holy Spirit. You have been given the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't think, I think we're in church and we talk about the Holy Spirit, but here's what he's saying. He says, Christian, you have God in you. Now, that may sound 
almost a little weird. But that is exactly what Scripture says. He is saying, God, and I mean God, is in you. God is with you in the darkest of moments. God is with you when you need wisdom. God is with you to give you peace. God is with you to give you comfort. It tells us he's the God of all comfort in Corinthians. He reminds us over and over. Look at John chapter 14. Jesus is about to go to the cross. Jesus is about to go to heaven. Jesus is about to leave the disciples. And in John 14, 16, he goes, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper. Some of your Bibles might have a different word there. You've heard this. It's the word parakletos. He said, I'm giving you one to come alongside you. And he says, look at that in John 14, 16, that he may be with you. How long? Did you catch that? God says that when you're saved, that God is with you forever. You're never, ever alone. If you feel like right now, oh, I feel alone in my life, God is with you if you're a Christian. If you feel like, man, I just feel like there's no hope, no, the God of hope is with you. And he says there in verse 17, the spirit of truth, who the world cannot receive, he's with you. In John 14, verse 26, he says, the helper, the Holy Spirit, who the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. If you go over to chapter 16, and you look there in chapter 16, verse 13, and he says, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. God says you have the Holy Spirit, God, in you. Now, if I just stop right now, would you just recap that for a minute? God says you're at peace with God. God says you have access to God. God says you stand in his grace no matter of our failures and our faults, which we got lots of them. He goes, we are a person that's never alone. We have the love of God. Yes, God is with us in tribulations. He's working to develop us. That should cause every one of us, when we stand up and sing here in church, we should shout at the top of our lungs. That should cause every one of us to say, oh, Lord, thank you. Now, why in the world do we walk and we're discouraged sometimes because we forget these things? We get so self-centered. Would you all agree? We get so caught up in today that we forget who we are in Christ. And Paul stops here in verse 5, and he says, let me just remind you who you are. And I want you to remember and rejoice in these facts. Look at verse 6. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, did you catch that? At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 7. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Here's what he's saying. Every person in this room, if you're saved by his grace, your sins are forgiven. But you were an enemy of God. And God looked at you and saw, just, I'll just use me as an example. He saw my sin, my wickedness, my filth. And he said, even though I know he is wicked, sinful, filthy, I'm going to die for him. That's what that verse is saying. And he even says in verse 7, uh, yeah, verse 7, he says, Somebody might die for somebody that's a good guy, but I'm not even sure that would happen. But he said, none of us were any good. Now, don't take offense to that. We all know we're sinners. He's saying that God is saying our sin was very clear to God. He still died for us. He said, I knew exactly who you were. I still died for you. By the way, if you're in this room and you don't know Jesus is Savior, you should stop and hear that. Jesus Christ knows who you are, still died for you. Wow. And so he is reminding us in this text, even though we were completely unrighteous, that Jesus died on a cross for our sins. But he goes further in the text. He says there in verse 9, much more then. It's like, wait a minute, there's more for you to hear. Having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. In verse 9, here's what he's saying. He's saying, 
You don't realize, yes, you were unrighteous, but you were condemned. You were on death row. You were already condemned to spend all of eternity. Now catch that. Not a moment. Eternity in hell. Eternity in the lake of fire. Eternity in torment, wrath, and judgment. He says, but God, he loved you so much, he justified you by the blood of Jesus Christ who shed it on the cross. And that Jesus justified you by his blood. But what else did he do? He saved you from the wrath of God. Wow. You can pick anywhere in this room anything that's ever happened in your life. Maybe, you know, one time I was on a cliff and had taken the wrong step and I was hanging onto a branch. My dad had to walk me through how to put your foot here, put your hand here, and to get me back out of that situation so I didn't fall. I did something dumb. And uh, he taught me out of that, and I didn't have injury or death from that situation. I'm grateful that my father did that. But that was just a moment. This passage is saying we are saved from all of eternity from the wrath of God. That's what God did for us in this text. But he wraps it up and he says this in verse 10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. What is he saying there? He said, Jesus died on a cross, paid for your sin. Your sins are forgiven. But he said, Jesus rose from the dead. He's still your Lord today. He prays for you, it tells us in Hebrews chapter 7. He cares for you. He is seated at the right hand of God to return and claim you and to give you a resurrected body. He says, Jesus lives, you do too. Jesus lives, you have a life for all of eternity. Jesus lives, you have complete security in him. Anybody in here ever worry sometimes and think, man, I might be going to lose my salvation? You don't lose your salvation. Do you hear me? If you're saved by God's grace, you are forever in his grace. You stand in his grace. He lives now, and you do too, and you will live forever. That is the promise of heaven. That should say, wait a minute, why am I worried about little things? I have eternity forever with him. He wraps up this passage in verse 11. He says, we also exult. I think that's the third time he used it in this short text. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. The bottom line I want you to hear today, rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. God has saved your soul. So how should we respond? What should we do with this text? Well, I'm going to repeat myself because Paul repeated himself. Three times in this text, Paul says, rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. The number one thing we should do today is say, Lord, I give thanks to you. But let me tell you what goes with joy. Joy says, I know I'm his, and I trust him. I trust him with my life. I looked over these notes this morning, and I thought, I probably should have typed that in the notes. Trust God. Trust God with everything in your life. No matter what you're facing today, trust God. But if you're sitting in this room and you don't know Jesus as Savior, the one thing that should be beating through your brain and your heart right now is, I need that. I need forgiveness. I want to be saved from the wrath of God. And if you've not been saved by His grace, realize you're lost and you need a Savior. I'd love to talk to you about that. Find somebody to talk to you about that. Stay after church today and say, I need to talk to somebody. But don't ignore it. The last joy like he talks about in this text, I want to ask you, what did Paul do? Was Paul so joyful that he never told anybody about Jesus? No. Was Paul so joyful 
that he focused his life on, I'll just live my life quietly and kind of just do my own thing. And if somebody comes over to my house and says, hey, please tell me about Jesus, I will. Otherwise, he just said, I'll kind of keep it to myself. Is that what Paul did? No. What did Paul say? I can't believe there's a Savior that did this and he saved my life and i got to tell other people about Jesus. That is exactly what should be our response. Joy should flow from our life to tell others of salvation. Only found, only found in Jesus Christ. He is our only hope. He is the only thing that truly matters. I want you to bow your heads. We're going to wrap up here. But I want you to just pray. I want you to just close your eyes. I want you to just think for a minute. I don't want you to just uh, think to yourself. First question to ask, am I forgiven for my sin? Am I saved by his grace? Am I a child of God with an eternal home in heaven? If you are, give thanks. Tell the Lord again today, Lord, thank you, and Lord, I want to live my life for you, and I want to shine for you and live for you. If you're not saved by His grace, I'd start crying out to God. I would talk to someone. they say, I need to understand. But I would also say, Lord, I want my life to reflect that joy. I cast all of my burdens on, your, on you. I cast all of my cares upon you. Maybe there are health problems. Maybe there are family problems. Maybe there are financial problems. Maybe there are sins that you struggle with. Bring them to the feet of Jesus. He is sufficient and able and He loves you. Ask Him to forgive you. Say, Lord, lead my life. Commit your life to Him. He is the King. Lord, I pray that Your Spirit leads us. I pray that Your Spirit directs us. I thank you, Lord, for the word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you stand? We are going to sing a song that uh, I want you to sing this song with gusto. Okay? Uh, how's that for a word? And I want us to sing that song thinking about what the Lord has done to save souls. We should sing strong. Now, we also have this time for invitation. If you say, hey, I'd like to be a part of Buena Vista Baptist Church, you can come talk to me right now. If you say, hey, I'd like to talk about Jesus, I need Him as my Savior, you can come talk to me right now. Or you might say, I just need to pray at this altar. You can do that. Or you can come pray with me, however the Lord leads. But I want you to focus on the Lord Jesus Christ and His great, great salvation. Let's sing.